Hello and welcome to the Genuine Learning Blog. My name is Melissa Galasso and I'm super excited to have you here for our first blog of 2021. So I wanna wish you all a very happy new year and after an interesting 2020, I hope that 2021 brings much joy, prosperity and happiness to all of our listeners. Super excited today to do our annual uh, 2020 year in review. Uh, so very often the blog likes to focus on what's coming down the pike, exposure drafts, major changes. However, it's always nice to step back uh, once a year and take a look at what happened during the year. And despite the fact that 2020 was actually some of the lowest standard setting, uh, we didn't see as much um, and we didn't see as many big projects, uh, the AACPA managed to really uh, issue quite a bit, uh, as well as the uh, GASB. Uh, FASB tended on a more conservative side, focusing primarily on niche topics and some obvious relief. Uh, so we're going to take a look at what was issued by the standard setters as final standards in 2020. We're going to start with the AICPA. Uh, so the AICPA was pretty busy. Now remember, they have multiple standard setters here. They have the Auditing Standards Board, who is going to issue our SASs and our SSAEs, or the Attestation Standards. And then we have ARSC, who's going to issue our SARs. And so the first standard of the year was SARS-25. Uh, and this one is really uh, addressing two key areas, materiality, uh, requiring that in a review that a calculation of materiality uh, happen. Uh, today, many firms do calculate materiality, but there's not an explicit requirement in the standards that require it. Uh, so now there will be an explicit uh, requirement in addition, it also now permits an adverse conclusion. Uh, and so an adverse conclusion is to state that the financial statements are materially misstated in a review. Uh, prior to this, that was not permitted. It was deemed that you couldn't have the ability to say something was materially misstated because you didn't have sufficient appropriate audit evidence to say so. Um, but now if you know something is materially and pervasively misstated, you would be able to issue an adverse conclusion. In addition, it does update the report to conform with some of the SAS 134 language, talking about the independence of the, uh, of the accountant in that scenario. Then we have our SASs. Uh, so SAS 139 through 142. 139 and 140 are wrapping up the reporting suite. Uh, so prior to this, we had SAS 134, which in, uh, creates a brand new audit report. And that's really 134, the plain Jane audit report. So it's going to be under GAP. Uh, it's going to uh, really be the basic report. Um, but from there, we have to consider other things that could happen. And so 139 focuses on the 800 section. Uh, so whether it's going to be a special purpose framework or summary financial statements, what changes in our report to conform with SAS 134. And then in SAS 140, it's conforming amendments with the 900 section. Uh, the most important one probably in there is our new single audit report um, that had quite a bit of change, not just for 134, but also to incorporate the terminology in the uniform guidance, as well as the 2018 yellow book. So lots going on in that new report. That really wrapped up the reporting suite. Uh, so SAS 134 through 140 are intended to be adopted together. Uh, they really are designed as a suite of standards. And so you really can't adopt 134, for example, without adopting 138. And you can't adopt 136 without adopting 138. Uh, and there's just a lot of interaction. And so they're intended to be adopted together. Uh, you'll note that in SAS 141, which is the next standard to be issued, uh, they delay the effective date. So SAS 134 through 140 were to be effective for a financial statement audits uh, after December 15th. 15, 2020. However, due to COVID and the stress that we have on our clients uh, who are facing uh, some more difficult uh, economic issues, as well as on firms who are helping their clients with PPP loans and forgiveness and all these other uh, grants that they've been assisting, it might not have been the best year to spring a suite of standards on our clients or on our audit firm. And so they do delay the standards by one year, deferring them to December of 2021. However, uh, under this for initial SAS, the SASs were for the most part outside of 135 and 138, not early adoptable. SAS 141 does permit early adoption. Uh, and so for firms who were on track, ready to go in December of 2020, the new audit report is available. But again, we do recommend that you adopt them as a suite of standards. 
Uh, the, fa uh, the ASCPA didn't stop. Uh, the Auditing Standards Board did not stop after they issued the reporting suite. They are continuing with a pretty um, busy calendar. They actually have quite a bit coming down the pike. We've talked about risk assessment. We've talked about some of the conforming amendments for pricing. So we have a lot still to come. Uh, so don't uh, think that the ASB is done now that the big reporting suite is done. There's still some pretty big standards coming down the pike. And so SAS 142, uh, which is our audit evidence standard, modernizes the concept of audit evidence. Both our clients as well as audit firms are using technology in many different ways. Uh, we might not have physical invoices. We might only have scans. We might not be able to look at things the way we have historically. And now with the introduction of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and you know drones and, and remote audits, uh, we have to be thinking about what does audit evidence look like in a more technological world? And so SAS 142 updates the audit evidence standard to really focus on what are the qualities or the attributes of audit evidence as opposed, to, as opposed to focusing on the procedure side of audit evidence. And so some pretty big changes there. Uh, those won't be effective until 2022. So there is a little bit of a lag there. And then effective in 2023, it says 143, which is focusing on accounting estimates. So historically, we've been a big uh, fan of historical cost, right? Gap was predominantly uh, historical cost with a random few fair value items uh, thrown in. However, in the last few years with revenue recognition and leases and CESOL, we've seen a movement of gap away from historical cost and to more estimates. And so as a result, we need guidance on how to best audit these very large, very complex estimates. So SAS 143 will give us a nice update there. Again, a lot of modernization, a lot of recognition of different um, ways of going through this, uh, change in risk assessment. And again, we are expecting later in 2021, a new risk assessment standard. We see a little bit of foreshadowing in 143 of what's to come for risk assessment. ASB is meeting later this month. Uh, we expect them to vote on quality management. Uh, it used to be quality control. You'll see a big change there uh, to adopt some of the changes from the international standards. Uh, so we are definitely not resting on our laurels. 2021 will equally be as busy as 2020. Uh, and then we have our attest standard really uh, wrapping up that suite. We had SSAE 19 issued previously that addressed an update to AUPs. However, there are two other engagement types that are in the attest standards, examinations and reviews. Uh, they also get an update. Uh, they have some conforming amendments with SAS 134, adding the language regarding the independence, but also creating a new engagement type. Uh, SSAE 21 introduces the concept of a direct examination. Uh, so today we have examinations. There will now be two types, uh, assertion-based, where the client provides an assertion, and then direct examination, where the client does not provide an assertion. So we get a new ATC section here. So uh, that one will be a little bit of an update. Uh, as you can remember, SSAE 19 removed the requirement for an AUP to have an assertion. So the kind of consistent movement there. And then SSAE 22, again, updating the review standards, uh, offering some changes there to the report, as well as to some of those requirements. So uh, the ASB as well uh, has been pretty busy. ARSC not so much. However, they did meet in November and you will see some potential items. Uh, they really focused more on education and making sure people are aware of what's going on. FASB only issued 11 standards, uh, so only is a kind of a stretch for a lot of us, but if you look at the standards, they're very niche. Uh, SSAE 20, or sorry, SSAE, uh, ASU 202001, which is really related uh, to a very niche area, really trying to address some of the financial instrument standards. So we've had the update for CECL, we've had some changes uh, to uh, topic 321. And so this was really just addressing two key areas, accounting for equity securities upon the application or discontinuance of the equity method, and then the scope considerations for uh, forward contracts and purchased options on securities. And so two really niche areas that probably won't impact all that many uh, entities as we look at it. Then we have ASU, uh, ASU 2020-02, which is focused on SEC guidance. So again, uh, unless you have SEC reporting, uh, this might not be a very big interest. Um, but for those of you who do have SEC reporting, uh, this is really incorporating some of the financial reporting uh, requirements from a topic uh, SAB Topic 6M, focusing on how do you measure 
current expected credits loss or the new CECL model? How do you develop the model? Um, what's kind of uh, guidance do you need on your methodology? What kind of documentation do you need? Uh, how do you validate it's a systematic method? So the SEC giving some guidance there on what they expect to see. Uh, ASU 202003 is a codification improvement. Uh, these are typically not going to have any impact on the standards. Uh, sometimes it's fixing an error, sometimes it's fixing a typo, sometimes it's adding cross-references. Uh, for this one, it was a lot of cross-references that were really included in here uh, to provide better guidance. And so we don't expect a lot of change in behavior, um, but we do believe that it will help improve the codification. It was issued separately because it is related to financial instruments, and so it was not a part of the bigger uh, codification improvement. It was focused just on the financial instruments to get that out in a more timely fashion, given the effect dates of things like CECL. Probably the biggest standard for most entities is going to be ASU 202004, which is reference rate reform. With LIBOR going away sometime this year in 2021, uh, they are offering a set of practical expedients as well as some exceptions to normal gap on the treatment of, uh, and to, uh, of uh, different instruments that are impacted. So whether it's a lease or a mortgage or a loan or a swap uh, that is tied to LIBOR, when it goes away, we're going to either have to switch to a backup rate or potentially have to go and renegotiate our rate. And so uh, instead of having to trigger remeasurement, instead of having to do reassessments under extant gap, they provide some exceptions to alleviate some of the difficulty due to the volume of transactions and the short period of time in which we have to make these changes. ASC 2020-05 was probably a hot topic this year, delaying the effective date of both leases and revenue recognition for private entities. So revenue recognition does delay uh, ASU 2014-09 another year to our December 2020 year ends for those entities uh, who just, you know, originally just couldn't get it done due to COVID and also extends leases for both uh, nonprofits that have conduit debt as well as all other non-public entities, including nonprofits without conduit debt. Uh, so extending really from what would have been a 2020 year end, uh, it was delayed in 2019 to 2021 and then in 2022 or in 2020. 2020 delayed to 2022. So uh, Lisa's has definitely been the gift that keeps on giving. We'll be talking about that for quite some time. In terms of the next set of standards, ASU 2020-06 is really uh, reducing the cost and complexity and trying to improve uh, comparability with convertible instruments. There are a lot of different models. They get you really different outcomes. So they reduce the number of models and try to more streamline uh, those convertible instruments that are, as well as contracts that are in an entity's own equity. So that would be, again, not for everyone, but for those people who are impacted, a nice simplification. ASU 202007 uh, will impact just our not-for-profit entities, and this is additional presentation and disclosure requirements for gifts in kind or contributed non-financial assets. This is really addressing a regulatory push. Uh, a lot of people were, uh, a lot of regulators were unhappy with the uh, measurement of fair value for these uh, donated items. And so they're going to provide some additional uh, disclosures as well as special presentation to call attention to them. Not changing how we calculate fair value, but just providing more insight and transparency into the calculation. ASU 2020-08 is a very narrow change. Uh, basically what this is doing is clarifying that when you are reevaluating your callable debt, uh, that you would do it each reporting period. Uh, this is addressing an issue in ASU 2017-08 uh, for uh, the callable debt. It said you can amortize it to the earliest call period, but the question was on when do we have to do this? And so they give some clarifying guidance there. ASU 2020-09 is related to some SEC guidance again. So for those of you who follow SEC guidance, we had SEC release uh, 33-107-62, which is providing amendments to financial disclosure requirements. And all we're doing here is incorporating that SEC guidance into the codification. ASU 20, uh, 2010 is the final codification improvements for the year. So for everything that was sort of generic, again, this is not going to be huge changes. These are correcting headers, titles, removing the word all to be less misleading, uh, fixing some typos. I'm glad to see that I'm not the only one who has typos in our work. Even FASB has some typos out there. Uh, massaging some verbiage for better accuracy, uh, using the new net asset terminology that we've incorporated for not for profit entities and adding helpful cross-references, so not material changes there. ASU 
Uh, the last ASU issued by FASB was ASU 2020-11, uh, and similar to the work under 2005, it is delaying the effective date for the insurance, the long duration contracts, uh, an additional year, but also providing, if you are going to adopt early, transition guidance to make it easier to allow people who do want to uh, early adopt this and don't want to take the additional year, a nicer transition. So that's it for FASB. Again, a lot of times when you look at it, you're like, oh, 11. But a lot of times you may only have one or two that really are impacting an entity. Uh, so you want to make sure that uh, you don't get too overwhelmed. Last but not least, GASB really did work hard this year. Uh, they have, similar to FASB, a change in their leadership. We had uh, a movement uh, to having a, a new uh, board chair. And so as a result, you had to kind of, um, you know, make sure that we wrapped up some of the projects that were outstanding when we made that transition. Uh, so GASB 93, uh, similar to uh, the ASU 2020-04 for FASB, is GASB's version of reference rate reform, providing some opportunities here for some uh, exceptions and some practical expedience to current gap for the movement away from LIBOR. GASB 94 addresses a quote unquote gap in gap. And we had guidance on when an entity operates another entity's non-financial asset. We had it for where it controlled the use, uh, but there was not a lot of guidance for any other relationship. So GASB 94 called PPP, uh, before PPP was related to our CARES Act funding, uh, was public-private partnerships or public-public partnerships uh, and really addresses these relationships that are out there uh, and also supersedes the current service concession arrangements and provides new guidance there. It also creates a new type of arrangement called an availability payment arrangement and provides the guidance for GAP for that. GASB 95 is the delay. Uh, so GASB took a more holistic approach instead of focusing on specific standards delay. Anything that was not yet fully effective received a one year delay. So a more holistic uh, approach. So really starting with GASB 83 all the way through GASB 93. GASB 94 was not included because when they issued that right before GASB 95, they already included a one year delay. GASB 96 is SPEDAS or subscription-based IT arrangements. This is providing guidance on cloud computing and hosting arrangements uh, for governmental entities. So FASB has two ASUs out there addressing that, but GASB was silent and they did not want to use the FASB guidance. And so they have issued very similar guidance to what we would use for leases for the subscription-based IT arrangements. GASB 97 addresses an issue with implementation of GASB 84 and looking at the definition of a component unit, uh, in particular for 401k plans and our defined contribution, as well as defined uh, as our um, I IRS uh, section 457 plans, providing an exception to that definition for a component unit so that we don't necessarily have to prepare financial statements for them. So that really wrapped up a, a big round of standard setting. GASB has some major projects on the horizon. Uh, we have revenue recognition. We have a new financial reporting model. Uh, they have some changes to disclosures as well as elements. So again, we're not expecting them to slow down anytime soon. They have quite a bit coming down the pike. In addition, they uh, issued the annual implementation guide. That's a set of questions and answers that are looking at some of the things that they get asked most frequently and help with implementation of upcoming standards. And last but not least, COVID accounting. Uh, so they did issue a technical bulletin providing some guidance on how do you account for PPP loans? Is this a special item? Uh, is, you know, what are the guidance on revenue recognition for some of these grants? Uh, are these eligibility requirements? And so they just give some guidance on this CARES Act funding. So uh, that is a very helpful guide and I would definitely recommend a good read there. All right, so that's a wrap. As I said, lots going on in 2020, despite it actually being a rather down year. Uh, with COVID, uh, the standard setters really had to think about how they were going to do this. The AICPA, GASB, and FASB all moved to virtual meetings, having to obviously deal with cross-country issues and time zones. So all of them trying to really figure out what this new normal looks like. And so definitely an interesting year, lots accomplished. So definitely want to make sure that you're all up to date as we move on into 2021. So thank you so much for joining me on the Genuine Learning blog, and I hope to see you on a future blog. Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye.